I am going to just briefly introduce them. I'm hoping that in some of our discussion, um, either in their responses to some of the things we're going to see on the slides, and in response maybe to some questions or discussion points that you all may want to raise during our town hall discussion, which we hope you will, that they will uh, fall back on some of that information and details to give you uh, some more information and points of reference about what they're discussing. So first, you've already met uh, Martisa Johnson, go to my right here. She uh, spoke earlier this morning, but she is the first elected African American woman for the Metro uh, Nashville public, as a Nashville public defender. Next to Martisa is to Jail High. She's the Vice President and Associate General Counsel at LifePoint Health here in Nashville, uh, healthcare provider in hospitals all over the country. Next to uh, next to Jail is Judge Alita Trauger. She's the only woman federal district court judge here in Nashville. She's been on the bench more than 20 years. She's a former federal prosecutor, a former uh, defense, she's been defense counsel and in private practice. And last but not least, Kristen Graham Kohler. Kristen is on the executive committee and a partner at Sidley in Washington, D.C. and travels around the country, uh, not just doing a complex white collar, defense, but also in helping organize women in white collar defense organization um, all over the country and really in other, in other countries as well. So we're really pleased to have this panel today um, and I'm hoping that they will tell you more about themselves as we're addressing some of the uh, slides that we're going to talk about. So really we're just going to talk about some of the things that have come out in actual headlines that are in the newspapers or media of real situations or topics. Uh, raised by by women. In this first one, which came out in the New York Times in 2017, by Judge Shiland, who's a federal district court judge in New York, uh, um, was. So, um, was raising the issue of, hey, what's going on? I'm looking out into the courtroom at council table, and I see men and women at times, but I only see men really handling matters. And what's interesting here is, she points out in this article that things can be done. She says, what can be done? Judges, clients, law firms, all have a chance to improve the situation. And she said, let's start with the judges. But before we get to you, Judge Trauger, first, let's just start with Martisa for a moment because one of the, one of the points she makes in the article is that this isn't in, on such display in government. And we've talked a lot today about leadership uh, Women, uh, women leadership in government. And Martisa, what do you what do you think? I know I've provided you this earlier and you've seen this article. What do you think about that comment? I think it is unfortunate, but it's absolutely true. I have found one of the, I think I expected it, but it's still shocking things. Um, being new to leadership, I was very excited to be now invited to these tables where they're making all of the criminal justice decisions in Nashville. And I found myself always hearing either the things I was saying repeated or someone has to speak after me that is a male in order for there to be some decision made about what I was saying. So I experience that now all the time. There is, I will make a point and either the table looks around to see if there are my male counterparts who will say anything or someone will just chime in to repeat what I've said in a different way or I have to be validated in my remarks in some way. And so I think that article certainly spoke to me because I experienced it. I didn't really experience that so much in the courtroom. I think that was just the nature of how we have our cases assigned. I was the lead counsel on most of my cases by myself. And so I would be the one arguing and they didn't have anyone else to look to to, to validate what I was saying. So I, I just stood on my own um, to make those arguments, but it's certainly that way in leadership. Judge Trauger, what did you think about her suggestion in this article that judges have a role to play in this kind of an issue? Well, I think, I guess this is on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, um, I think we do. Um, I have to say, I don't really have that problem that Judge Scheidlin has. Uh, I think, in part, uh, the law firms send women lawyers to my court because they know I want to see women lawyers, not that I treat them any differently or I give them any favors. 
but I've always, I helped start the uh, Women's Bar Association in Nashville and in Tennessee. Uh, they know that I support uh, those organizations. I, I'm in the National Association of Women Judges. And so I think they just presume that I'm kind of a feminist or something. <laughs> <laughs> and so they send women lawyers. Um, occasionally I'll have a situation where uh, a man may be presenting something uh, and it's clear to me that the woman sitting at the table wrote the brief and they're needing to be consulting with that person and sometimes I might I might uh, make a joke about I see you have to consult with your lawyer uh, <laughs> and uh, kind of make the point but uh, but but I mean I often look out and I've got women on both sides of lawsuits civil criminal uh, um, we just have a lot of women lawyers practicing in federal court I guess I don't know I don't have too much of that problem I certainly did experience what you're talking about in the early days I was the first woman that got to sit in the room of the Tennessee Bar Association board uh, other than Julie Jones who was kind of the secretary of your former partner um, and also I was the first woman lawyer that sat on the Tennessee Court of the Judiciary which heard ethical complaints against uh, state judges uh, and I experienced exactly what you're talking about that um, I would say something uh, and then and there would be no reaction or no positive reinforcement or whatever. And then a man would say almost exactly what I had said, and then that proposition was accepted. So I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm not in any groups like that now, I guess, since I'm a judge, they don't listen to me anyway. But, <laughs> but, uh, that, but that's a real thing. All right, well, Kristen and Tajel, you, you all are both in the private sector. Uh, to jail in a large a large company that, that operates across the country has a lot of moving parts um, this article suggests that clients have a role to play on this issue and, and what is your perspective on that absolutely um, are you guys hearing me absolutely um, for for me when I look at the lawyers that are representing me I do want them to generally be representative and I, I recognize that that is not always easy to do, especially with the work we're doing around large firms, right? There's a, a to me, a, a wide gap of female partners, gap of non-white men partners, so I recognize that that's the case. My expectation, though, that my firms are working towards helping that to be different, that they're as committed to inclusion and diversity as I am, and I've asked them for that. I've had discussions with great partners here that are helping to work on those things, that we can work on them collaboratively together. Um, I see my role in that is also potentially as a mentor, helping younger folks come up. I was a law firm practicing for years before going in-house. I understand how the system works, so it's a, it's a give and take. One, I think the, the client has a responsibility to set the expectation for, for what you want to see, and then be a partner in helping it come to be. It's not something that happens overnight, but I do think it's something that you have to deliberately work towards. Um, I can think of one example, I was working with one of, a, it was a vendor that we actually, that does a tremendous amount of work for us, and I said, wow, I just went out to your website, because I know I work with you guys all the time, I'm talking to these people on a daily basis, and I went out to your website, you have not one female partner at your firm. That's shocking to me. And they were kind of, you know, taken aback, oh, we have these women here, and I said, yes, they, and they're wonderful, but not one of them is a partner. That seems strange to me. What do you think about it? We had a really good discussion, and they took immediate action. For them, it was something that they knew was important to me. I don't think it was something that they just they didn't pay attention to it, right? It wasn't something that they were deliberately not trying to invest and promote women, but it wasn't something that was top of mind. They were out there building their business, right? Um, and we had discussions, and we had periodic discussions, and now they have their first ever female partner. And I remember running into her at a conference, and she was like, you know, I just wanted to say thank you. Because I know that you didn't say I needed to be the partner, but I know that you spoke up. I knew that was something that was important to you, and I will tell you that those guys listened to you. And maybe since I hold some of the purse strings, maybe. But um, it was really, really helpful to see that you can have that impact. So I would encourage folks that have that opportunity. Again, it's not a, I'm going to hold this hammer out here and hammer you with it, but it's a partnership and, and really a collective effort in thinking about how you make those changes happen. Sometimes just bringing the awareness is enough to start making some small steps. So I do think we absolutely have a responsibility in that. And from a law firm perspective, 
firms definitely have a role to play here. And the great thing is, is that clients are demanding it. And that's very different than where we've been historically. So historically, the clients decided who they wanted to argue their case or who they wanted to try their case. And in the large bet the company cases, historically, that was the white, gray-haired man that was going to do that. And we have really seen a change. Clients are demanding diversity, and it's fantastic. And it's incumbent upon us to ensure that that happens. So at law firms, we have to make sure that we are putting the junior diverse partners or associates Who's the best person to argue the motion? Who's the best person to handle this witness? We need to make sure that we are doing that, that we're getting um, diverse lawyers out in pitches and all of those things. I want to just, I was going to share an, an analogy with you of something that happened to me last week that I just think is really <coughs> helpful to, to this discussion. So I was, I was on vacation last week in Nepal and Bhutan. Um, and this was for my husband's 50th birthday. And one of the things he really wanted to do for his 50th birthday was to take a helicopter ride um, up and around Mount Everest. And so I was, um, you know, a little, I'm a little cautious about helicopters. <laughs> Understandably so, um, particularly in developing countries. Um, but, but I said, you know, he really wants to do this. So, so I'm going to do this. And so we show up at the airport. And I am introduced to our captain, Priya, who is the first and only female helicopter pilot in Nepal. And I immediately have a sigh of relief because I know, I know that she had to work 10 times harder to become that in Nepal, which is not as progressive as he. Um, and so I was immediately relieved by this. And so, you know, we and clients, we need to do the same thing. You know, the women and the diverse lawyers, they have had to work 10 times as hard to get to where everyone in this room is. And so we need to celebrate that. And we need to make sure that we're giving them opportunities and elevating them as well. The only thing I would add, and I'll just small anecdotal story in thinking about the firms and the pitches and so when I was moving to an in-house position not currently where I am I knew that that uh, client was that that company was a client of ours so I just did a search to see what we had with respect to documents and what types of things we we're working on with them and I found the pitch that was submitted I think two years prior to the client and there I am front and center as someone going to do work with on this and I had never touched work for that client so you have to be it has to be real, right? It can't just be, you know, putting someone in that you're not actually anticipating will do the work, sure. that will not have face time, that will not get the opportunity to grow with those things, but actually making it a collaborative that truly is, is going to play out the reality. So yeah. I think that's key and important. We have to not just lip service towards it, we actually have to do it. Yeah, I totally agree. There can be no bait and switch. I mean, you have right. to give these lawyers the opportunity. Absolutely. And so on the other side, what can young younger women counsel, what, what can younger women attorneys do? Or maybe they're even, uh, not just beginning, but on the cusp of some type of a leadership opportunity. What would you propose or suggest, based on your own experience or things you've seen, that would help them become successful in that endeavor? Anybody? Maybe I will. Do you want to start, Judge? Yeah. I was going to say, um, part of it is finding your tribe, finding the people that are going to boost you up when you need a little boost, find the people that will be good mirrors for you so that when you have places to work on, they're going to tell you in a kind way, so you work on those things, right? None of us start perfect and perfect for the jobs that we're going to do today, and certainly not perfect for the leadership roles that we want in the future. So I think finding a group of people, for me, I call them my board of directors. Um, they're college friends. My husband is the chair of that board because I, <laughs> he lives in my house. I've got to make sure that all the things that I'm doing are going to make sense for our family life. Um, so it could be partners I used to work with, people within my organization, people from outside. But having a good group of people that can um, give you what you need at the time when you're trying to make pivotal, pivotal decisions, 
but also to be reflective, right? You have to constantly be working and constantly improving to be a good leader and to really get into leadership positions. And so when I think of myself, you know, when I started practicing, um, I looked to the people that actually wanted to connect with me. That may not have been the person that looked like me, or it may have been, but I wanted to try everyone to see really who would be the right person or the right people for me personally to meet me where I was to help me to get to the next spot and for that relationship to be reciprocal. So for the people that really put trust in me and that really took time to mentor, I wanted to do my absolute best work. I wanted to make sure that they shine at all times, right? And so one partner I remember was just the most absent-minded but the most lovable. He would sit me down on days and I'm just like, oh, this sucks. And just really give me a boost, right? To help me really just feel better and remind my remind me that today may not have been an awesome day, but you had like stellar days for the past four, whatever it was. But he would forget everything. So I always made sure that I had a copy of everything that he might possibly need if we were traveling to visit a client together. Because lo and behold, that would help him to look good, right? And help him to not be the bumbling person in the room, right? Because so just trying to be that reciprocal partner, finding the people, and again, they could look like you, they could not look like you, but being willing to explore and really find good personal connections would be the first place that I start as a young lawyer trying to, just try to make it and trying to figure out what it is you want to be with your life. And I'm still doing that today, so that, that's a never-ending to me process. Um, yes, finding good mentors is very, very important. Also, I think uh, having the courage to kind of ask for the kind of work you want to do. Uh, and I'll just tell you one story from my background. I was recruited into the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Nashville uh, for the women's slot. Uh, there was one women's slot. And the woman that I succeeded um, uh, had only done civil work. And so it was presumed that I was going to do civil work. So. I got in there, and after a couple months, it became very clear to me that I was not going to be trying cases doing the civil work in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I was very lucky. I screwed my courage to the sticking post. I went to the U.S. Attorney, and I said, I really want to be in the courtroom. I want to try cases, and I'm not going to be in there doing civil work. Would you please give me criminal work? And so he did. I was very lucky. He gave me the Cookville docket. So I had two FBI agents up there, and I tried every case in Cookville, and then of course it went from there. But it was kind of, um, it was a, late, a little atypical for me to, to be that courageous, but I was, and it paid off, and I would encourage people to ask for the work that you want to do, because it might pay off. I think that's really key, and on top of the being courageous piece, um, I had to decide that I was just gonna be exactly who I am. Once I decided that I had the courage to do this work, I started to not let people in positions at the office I was in or in the courthouse or anyone define who I would be or what my ceiling was. And so I have often been the one to say, you know, I want the serious case. I can recall being pregnant in the Nashville courthouse and judges would say all types of wild things to me about calming down and um, slowing down and lowering my voice and all of those things and I'm just unapologetic with who I am. I am going to get my point across even at these tables that I'm at now where I'm being repeated and it's frustrating. I make sure that you know I'm in the room, my voice will be heard and I do think that requires courage but I think it also requires you to make that decision that look, I am who I am and you have me here for a reason, and I'm gonna walk in that purpose. And the, the one thing I add, that will add, and I think it, it's uh, consistent with things that the other panelists are saying, is hard work. I mean, hard work is absolutely critical, and that's either honing your skills as a lawyer or even in leadership. Leadership takes a lot of hard work. You've gotta read, you've gotta think, you've gotta, Work on your IQ, you gotta work on your EQ, you gotta, <laughs> you know, there's just a lot. Um, and so there is no substitute for hard work, no matter how senior you are in the courtroom, preparation is everything. And so to me, the, the key is, is basic, just hard work. I, I think you made the new Martisa this morning that said, you're gonna be uncomfortable, but just do it anyway. And I thought that was really good advice. 
So here's another article. This was from the Atlantic, um, fall of last year, and this is uh, this was about the article was about a motion that was filed. I think this was in Florida, Sandy. I think maybe Tampa. So. Uh, yeah. Um, where <laughs> counsel filed a motion in limine to preclude the woman counsel from being emotional in court yes. uh, on the other side. So, um, but it, the point of this is, of the article, was that witnessing cultural biases about w women and about women counsel. And I'm sure everyone here in this room has a story. We've heard some of them today. But what can women do to actively overcome sort of an anticipated bias? Uh, maybe not even knowing whether it really is truly there or not. Uh, what can women do to, to try and overcome that? And, and at the same time, use some of their strengths as a woman to be a good advocate for their client. Um, Kristen, you thoughts? Yeah, it's, this, is a, this is a tough issue, and I could, I could go on at length. <laughs> issue but I think it's it's you're, you're always trying to strike that balance um, of aggressive but not too aggressive strident but not too strident you know there's just always this balance that you're trying to strike personally what I have done um, I'll just give you a couple examples you know I'm pretty small <laughs> And I tend to use my size and my demeanor to my benefit because most prosecutors at the Department of Justice that I deal with every day are men and you know they they underestimate what I'm going to do um, intellectually because you know I'm this little woman um, and so I just use it to my advantage and I use it to my clients advantage the other, what goes part and parcel with that is um, D.C., where I practice, um, is a very elite town and elitist, a very elitist town. And I didn't go to an Ivy undergrad, and I didn't go to an Ivy for law school. And I went to state schools. And when um, individuals in D.C. see that on my resume, they also underestimate what I'm going to do. And so I just use, I just embrace that. This is who I am, you know, you have to recognize who you are, and I just embrace it, and then I just use it to my advantage, and I just run circles around them. And so that's, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the way that I have approached it. To Joe? Um, I would say, I would agree with, you know, everything that Kristen has said. You have to also kind of know who you're dealing with. Like, I, the worst situation, I think, is that you're kind of stepping into the space and you're kind of jarred by the, the bias, right? Like, you should try to understand who you're going to be working against with, understanding maybe what they're going to bring into the room, and just be prepared for those things so you can just, just push them aside and then get to the work. At the end of the day, we can't, I can't change someone's bias in one day. So, but what I can do is be my authentic self in that space, um, if I think things have gone outside the bounds to raise it in that space, which is not always easy to do and also not always the right thing to do depending on what you're trying to get accomplished. So keeping the goal in mind, but getting prepared for those situations where um, perhaps when you're running up against something that just can be jarring, right? You know, I, I hear of these litigators going into court and having to wear pantyhose. I can't imagine the last time I put pantyhose on, and so that's what I would need to do to go to court. It just seems so bizarre to me, but at the end of the day, knowing that, finding the people that can tell you that that's going to be important, that you're going to have to understand that that's a real thing, regardless of whether you like it or not, and to make a <coughs> conscious decision of how you're going to approach the situation, and again, use it to your advantage, right? And so, you know, being as knowledgeable as you can be about the situations that you're stepping into, whether they're fair, unfair, just taking that, deal with the emotions of that beforehand, if you can, and stepping into the situation, she can present the, the right thing to, to win, right? It's all about winning when you're a lawyer. Um, and also making sure that you are, you leave there with your, I don't know, feeling, feeling good about what you've done that day. Like, I never like to leave a space feeling as though I've been deflated because of someone else's weird interactions or their discomfort or their ignorance. I like to leave them with that. They can take it back with them, and I'm still going to leave with what I intended to get accomplished that day. So that's what I would say about that issue. 
Martisa? I agree. Um, I think I would add that I have learned some real zen breathing yes. over, <laughs> over the course of practice. Because I think not only being a woman, the, the title here is about what it takes to be a trial lawyer if you're not a man, but also adding the layer of being a woman of color into to my atmosphere has been incredibly challenging at times where I make no apologies that I am a fierce advocate for my clients, but all I receive a lot of times in return is that I'm too aggressive or angry or like I said before, that I need to calm down or stay in my role as a woman pretty much. And so I have to really definitely take account of what my goal is and in my case my goal is oftentimes to help the person who needs it the most in that situation and so I have had to navigate trying to be the most prepared be the best at what I could do and I, I do think that in addition to all that there are times where you have to push back and I I have done that I think that those times have, have gone well I had to be really strategic about that pushback but there's just some times that I feel like you just can't you just can't let that go now I don't openly challenge a judge while they're on the bench in court and making a ruling but as I have progressed in my career I do um, say you know judge is, is there a time that I can set up an appointment to come and talk to you in your in your chamber and I've done that and I've had a conversation with the judge about microaggressions and using the word aggressive and when you're talking to a woman of color and how I don't see that as a compliment sometimes it's not a readily made compliment. Um, and I've had to do that. I had to push back really hard as a woman who's trying to advocate for her client and being told to, to calm down because I'm pregnant. Like I, I'm not disabled. I'm here and I'm ready to fight. And I, had to, I think it's important to navigate the system and all of the things that we've said. But sometimes you really have to educate people when what, they what are. What kind of responses have you gotten from the judges when you tell Apologies. I have gotten. Oh, I, I didn't. I didn't know that. And I have to refrain from saying, "Do you Google? Um, <laughs> do you know? Have you had implicit bias training?" And they and they haven't. So I understand that. But most of the times, it is apologetic. There isn't necessarily a change in behavior across the board, but they at least know. They they see me coming. Put it that way. <laughs> well. Oh, go ahead, I'm just going to tell it's kind of an entertaining story from my past um, uh, along those same lines. Uh, I was doing a prosecution when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office. It was a prosecution of former Governor Blanton. Uh, so it was on the front page of the paper every day, big deal for like a six week trial. Anyway, uh, we had to import a judge from Memphis uh, to try the case for a variety of reasons. Excellent trial judge. He was on the Sixth Circuit at the time, but he'd been a trial judge, and he was an excellent trial judge. I was the only woman lawyer involved in that prosecution. It was in 1980, and uh, there were two of us prosecuting. Uh, the other fellow well, was, was a white male, and I. But it, it's very clear we had 50 percent of the responsibility. It was split 50-50. Uh, every time the judge wanted lawyers to come to the bench or to go to his chambers, uh, he said, gentlemen, every time. Uh, we got about halfway through the trial and I thought, you know, I think it's got to be really clear to him that I am not hearing Bob Lynch's briefcase and that I'm doing 50% of this trial and I'm really getting tired of this. Uh, and so when we had a, uh, a chambers conference, I hung back. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. So I hung back and I said, Judge, you know, every time you summon all the lawyers, you say, gentlemen. And I paused. And I just, and I thought he would immediately say, oh my God, you know, I'm an old uh, Southern gentleman. It didn't even occur to me. I'm so sorry. Well, there was nothing. There was silence. <laughs> And I said, well, I said to myself, well, maybe he needs a suggestion. And I said, well, you know, you could say counsel. Silence. At which point I scurried out of his chamber. <laughs> the next time he summoned us all to the bench or to his chambers, he said, gentlemen. And he kept saying gentlemen for several more days. And then finally, I think it was after he went back to Memphis and maybe he talked to his wife. I'm not sure. 
But at any rate, at some point, he went to counsel. Uh, and that page of the transcript is in my memory book, I'll tell you that. But, but it took a lot of courage, and, and I did not get the reaction that I thought and hoped for. Well, that's a perfect segue into my follow-up question here, and that is, we all work in still a male-dominated area, uh, particularly in leadership roles. Um, how do we address that with our male colleagues? When, you know, even with people that we have such high respect for, um, that have mentored us or work side by side with us, um, that we that we just feel very close to as a colleague, how, how can we address these kinds of issues that are that are perhaps just, you know, there's a, a lack of awareness about it. Um, what is the best way to try to, to handle it? I just take it head on. So one of my dearest mentors, um, he was like a father to me, he's 76, so he's been practicing a long time. He will always say, when we're you know, talking about anybody, he'll say, female lawyer or lady lawyer, you know, that it just, they come together, of course. And I say, Tom, she's just a lawyer. <laughs> but I, you know, I just do it head on. So when those issues come up, whether it's with him or my mentors who are in their 60s or my mentors who are in their 30s, I just, I just address it head on because I just, I just think it's better. It's just better, at, to your point, you know, right in the moment. Just do it, address it, and, and hopefully it gets better. Now, he still says it. I still have to correct him. But you just, you just keep at it. So, Jill, have you had that situation? Sure. Um, and I, so maybe I'm not a litigator, but I am more outspoken and aggressive. And that's usually the tact I like to take. But it's not always the right one. Like, you know, and so I, and I recognize that, that sometimes you have to, meet the person where they are and also have the strategy for what you're trying to accomplish. Um, sometimes people do need to be uncomfortable. And I'm okay making people uncomfortable, but I don't want to do that all the time. I don't want to be the person that's always, right, you carry that extra burden also sometimes as a woman, but definitely as a people of color, of having to carry that burden of always making people uncomfortable. And that's not always a good place to be if you're trying to advance an organization. One, you, to me, you have to know where your organization is and just acknowledge that. It may be in a place where it's ready to start making changes and to start putting the real things in place that need to happen to start addressing those sorts of things. So that, one, it's not just one person um, taking on those discussions. You have others, and the people that are taking on those discussions aren't always the people that are directly impacted by them, right? It's not just the women speaking up about for women. It's men raising their hands and saying, hey, you know, you just spoke over her. Let's hear and let her finish what she has to say. Or it's not also always a person of color that says, wow, we have 50 candidates that came in, none of them was a person of color. It should be other people that are recognizing those things. So yes, I'd like to take things head on, but I do recognize that you have to be strategic. My, you know, the, I love my organization. I really um, enjoy being there. And I'm recognizing where it is. And I'm recognizing the places that you can have better impacts and who people, who the individuals are that really want to put the work in. These aren't like passive things that happen, to your point. You have to really talk about them and make folks uncomfortable from time to time, make different decisions, um, question decisions that are being made. And I think there's sort of a strategy for each different place that has to be deployed when appropriate. So um, I might be more aggressive, but maybe someone else isn't. We can work together to, I don't know, get those small things, but also the bigger things addressed. She said, I think you sort of described how you might respond. I agree with everything she said as well. Okay, Judge Trogger, have you, I'm, I'm sure as uh, on the bench, that's not really a, a, a problem, but uh, for you with respect to what happens in your court, but in your experience, have you had to uh, directly uh, respond to that sort of uh, either implicit or overt? Uh, well, there was a lot of it, you know, when, when when we started practicing law in, in, in bigger numbers, uh, a lot of it. Um, and I have to say, my approach was basically to let it roll off my back. I did not make issues. I figured the best way for women to advance uh, in the law was to be the best lawyer in the room. And the key to that is being the most prepared lawyer in the room. Exactly. <laughs> and so um, um, I tended to just ignore things 
and uh, and just tried to be a really good lawyer. And uh, I was lucky to have a lot of uh, male mentors because that's about all there was, except for Sissy Daughtry around when I was when I was coming up. Um, and I wouldn't probably have had those male mentors if I had made an issue of everything. Uh, I, we just couldn't do it. You just couldn't do it, or you you wouldn't be able to advance. So. I mean, it's a different day, and it, it's. I think it's, it's. It is easier for people to say things now. And I mean, I got called on something by a lawyer just a couple weeks ago, something that I had said, and he called me on it in a conference in my chambers. And I thought, oh my God, yeah, good for you, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, but, but I would say that that you know, in the early days, we would grouse about things to each other, but, but, but not me. I mean, the most outrageous thing that ever happened to me when I was a law clerk, I took something over to, to a, a, a senior partner's office. I delivered it, and he said, uh, uh, are you so-and-so's, are you Bob Brandt's law clerk? I mean, are you Bob Brandt's secretary? And I said, no, I'm his law clerk. He took me by the shoulders, physically, marched me down the hall, stood me in the doorway of another partner's office and says, this is Bob Brandt's law clerk. I want me one of these. <laughs> now, now, what do you do? I mean, what, what could I do? I mean, I was, you know, I'm still in law school and talked about objectification, you know. It was pretty incredible, but you just laugh. I just laughed. And, Yes, did I do? Sometimes it's still the right yes. response in the moment. I right? think it is. You have to I think it is. Too. You've got to be comfortable with what you're doing, where you are. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I need a, a moment to think, <laughs> to experience it, leave, think, and then be able to respond later. So I, I often tell younger lawyers that they don't have to be the hero at that time in the moment. You've got to be so comfortable with your space, your station, with where you are. You can think, you can come back later, and, or you can just decide to do something different. Each of our responses is just that, each of our own responses, um, and we need to be okay with that. So I think that's an adequate response a lot of the time, you know? So well, certainly as a law clerk yeah. at the time, I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do? You know, I mean, you're not going to do that's anything. That's when you call up your board and you exactly. get angry and you let it all out because it's the wrong thing to happen and it's not right and you should be able to vent and get that out. Well, I was able to tell Bob Grant <laughs> that I was working for. I came back and told him and he said, well, that's incredible. You know, he thought it was that great. Yeah. So at least I was able to talk about it. Right. Well, so Kristen says, what, what are you going to do? So here's what some folks are, are talking about doing. Um, you probably all read, um, this was from the American Lawyer, but there was a, a letter in various papers that was um, published uh, throughout the media about an open letter from general counsels uh, across the country, major, major firms, talking about the need for more diversity in their counsel. And so the snippet here says that and what I want to focus on, you know, so you can have policies and organizations and committees, but this is saying the reality is that you must consciously and personally invest in diversity and inclusion, and then it lists the different ways in which that can happen. So I think it's suggesting or stating here that it's an individual that's making this happen and not a policy, not a committee, um, not an organization. So, so what, what are ways and which how do you how do you view that and what are ways in which individuals wherever they are can begin this process and have an impact martisa you you have any thoughts about that so i, I agree with the statement totally i think it is on the individuals to make sure that we are and so myself i think i said this earlier that it's on me to make sure i'm not the last um, first african-american public defender in Nashville. So I have to create a space where I am bringing other voices to the table with me, creating opportunities where they can be seen and heard and promoted within that my leadership is reflective of my value related to inclusion and diversity and being really intentional about that. Once you decide that that's something that is, is a core value of your agency or your firm or your 
your government, wherever you are, and you have to really set a strategic plan about what that means and how you will accomplish those goals. It's one thing to bring a young, diverse lawyer into a place and then never do anything else with them. Just so you can say, in my hiring class this year, I brought on three or four um, African-American males in, into the firm. Okay, but what do you do after they get there? And, and that is the piece that's important, and I think it's on us to have these conversations, but it's on everyone to recognize the issue and make sure we are um, providing the appropriate support and mentorships once we bring um, candidates into our fold. Yeah, I, I totally agree um, with that. It has to be done on an individual level, and we all have to make sure that we're developing, retaining, promoting those individuals. So I'll, I'll just give you two concrete examples of what we're doing at Sidley. So I, I sit on the executive committee of the firm, which is essentially the, our board of directors. and. Um, what we did in the in the DC office recently is we ran we, we selected the top 10 or 15 business generators in the, the DC office and then we just ran their matters um, the percentage of women that were working on their matters and the percentage of diverse associates working on their matters and this isn't perfect you know it's, it's not a perfect analysis but we just ran that analysis and then I just sat down with each of them and just had a conversation. I mean, this isn't, this isn't going into their annual review, it's not going to determine their compensation, but it was just to have a conversation to say, okay, in the last year, you have worked with 10% women and 90% men. Or in the last two years, there has not been one ethnically diverse associate on your matters. And it's just to have that conversation and to try and increase awareness because some, I would say most of it is not intentional. It's just raising the awareness, getting them to understand it, getting them to understand their own implicit bias of just <coughs> naturally gravitating toward people who look like them. Um, and so that I think has been effective and, and we'll continue to do that. Again, it's just a, we have to change it on an individual basis. So if I can change, you know, Five or ten or fifteen of the rainmakers, you know that will that will help going forward. So that's one issue. Are they all men? The rainmakers? They're not. Okay. But I would say the majority of them are. And then the other thing, um, I chair the uh, executive committee subcommittee on partnership consideration, and we are very conscious as we are putting together our partnership class of making sure it reflects society and making sure it reflects our clients and and so you really you have to do that you have to be very intentional and again it's on an individual basis so i'm sure you all saw when paul weiss announced its partnership class and it, and they published photos which i'm not quite sure how that got by anybody <laughs> in terms of approval but Leaving that aside, and not to denigrate them, it's a great form. But, um, you know, when that happened, um, our leadership at the firm came to me and said, you know, Kristen, let's, let's look at our pipeline. What's our pipeline look for one year out, two years out, three years out? And that's what you have to be doing. You have to be very um, intentional about this and on a very individualized basis. I would agree. And I would you know, remind folks, I remind myself, we pick our firms because we like them, because they do great work for us, or any of the other organizations that you work with, whether it's a firm or other partners, it doesn't really matter, but you pick them because you like them, right? And you have some personal relationships. So it's not a, we're gonna beat you up because we're not seeing eye to eye on certain things, or not the space where we feel, you know, you're reflected with me today, but it's how can I help you improve? In essence, same essence as you are doing work and you're helping me to be better, right? Every day my outside firms do work for us that if, if not for that work, I could not perform what I needed to do for, for my client. And so again, I truly view this as, as a partnership, setting some expectations, having open conversations about it. And maybe initially those conversations are uncomfortable, but the more you have them, then they become normal. Then this just becomes part of what we're doing on a regular basis 
checking in to see, okay, where are we? How can I be helpful? What are we doing? What progress are we making? Just like I'm talking about my matters. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I don't think it needs to be this, I don't know, holding you out to be disgraceful because you're, you, you look like this. It can be more of a, okay, here's where we are today. Tomorrow we want to be here. What does that path look like for us? And, and how can I help you understand that my expectations are here? Here's what would make me feel good or better, truly better about working with you and and, and moving the needle. So, yeah. so. a lot of clients demand um, reporting statistics, and I I actually think that's a, that's a good thing because what, needle faster, but yeah, faster. <laughs> because what is inspected is respected. And so when clients make you report on a quarterly basis, what are your diversity statistics, it makes people pay attention. And if that goes directly to the bottom line, and it's an ROI, and so I think that that helps too. Give up the clicker. <laughs> This is an important topic, I think, for women, um, um, not only just in uh, however they define their own success, but also uh, in reaching leadership roles, self-promotion. Um, what can you do? And this was a recent article uh, this year in the Washington Post that was talking about this particular study that may not apply in all instances. It was talking about how there's a difference between the way men and women can network successfully. And I can just tell you that um, so I've been around a while, but I, I, I can just remember trying to do it, like, uh, you know, right out of law school, the way I saw other men uh, trying to build their practice. Um, and I was in Dallas at the time, and there were things they were doing that I could not, would not do. So, you know, it, it, but, but there are differences. And so what ways here, uh, this one is suggesting that this particular study is saying that women have found ways to become successful in leadership roles by having a group of very supportive, sort of an inner circle of women. And I'm curious to know if that is something that you all have experienced and what advice you can provide for uh, some of the women here about um, how to utilize that and how to develop it. I, well, yeah, my, my board for sure, but I think, so it's, this, I see a little bit of a different space. I think that's a key piece of having a board that can be very diverse, right? Folks that are your friends, you know, colleagues, mentors, and other people. But in this context, I read this, or I think about this as having women leaders or women supporters that are truly in your organization. I think that is very, very important. Um, so that you have some supports right there built in into your system. Once you can start leveraging each other's networks, there, there tends to be less of us around, um, but you, you feel, I don't know, at least I personally can speak for myself, feel comfortable having different discussions with the women leaders in my organization than I do with the men around, you know, well, I, I want to ask for a raise, or I want to ask for a promotion, or I want to think through where my next thing could be, or I'm having a challenge with this individual person help me figure out how I can resolve it. What should I say to have, to, to have a tough discussion? Sometimes having that conversation with women just feels better. We relate to each other in a, in a, in a way that is, is more similar, it's more comfortable for us. But it can't be just women. I think having key women that you can absolutely trust and go to and say anything um, is very, very absolutely important. And also being able to leverage each other's networks. Um, I work in legal. There are women in our organization that work in other departments that I have to work with. Having folks that I can go to say, wow, I haven't worked with this person before. Give me some insight. What do you think? Who should I talk to before I start working on this project with them? The, those things are just key. And again, all, all of, so much of leadership is relationship building and breaking down barriers to have conversations and connecting with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis so that when, you know, the way I think about it is that you're kind of building a bank. So maybe we're not working on something today, but we're gonna have some regular touch points and we're gonna try to find the connection points so that when we have to have a hard discussion or work on a hard topic, I've built up some equity in this bank, right? You know me, you know about me. If we have to have a hard discussion, especially as the lawyer, if I have to say no, you know it's not personal, you know it's not about you, it's about trying to do the right thing for the organization. We've built up enough of a rapport, we have respect, 
we have a relationship, or I, I can borrow someone else's capital maybe from time to time, some of the other women's uh, capital that they have with that individual to say, we're, we're trying to do the right thing so they don't become personal issues. I see so many times in the workplace, especially when you're lawyering, when we have to have these hard discussions with the people that we support, that it becomes personal so quickly. And I feel like as lawyers, we're all, I'm always baffled. I'm thinking, we're talking about something that I am not thinking about when I go home. So this is not personal for me at all. But when it's an individual trying to get a job done, right? I work with hospital operators. They want to move fast and get things done. For them, it often feels personal. So the networking and leveraging the other women's relationships and having those key people you can talk to, I think, is very, very important. Not, they can't be 100% of your group. You have to be able to branch out and, and work with others that don't look like you. To my point that I made earlier about making connections across all the cross sections in your organization. But I do, me personally, love having a group of key core women um, that I can just say, hey, here's a sticky situation I'm in. I sent an email, I probably should have, whatever it is, let's talk this through, help me walk through so I can fix it. Or, you know, I want to make a, a bold move, I want to ask for something boldly for myself. Help me walk through it, be a sounding board for me. I, uh, and for me personally, having a discussion with another woman that's either done it or is contemplating the same thing always just feels better. So, Kristen, how was it for you in the early days, though? I mean, you're you're in competition with other women yeah. that are trying to rise in the firm, and you know, they're not always going to be your friends. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, you know, I had very good experiences with the women at the firm. Um, Karen Pop is is one of my mentors, and um, you know, she worked to found the Women's White Collar Defense Association, and so I have have had good experiences. The other thing about the white collar practice is it's a referral business in a way that some of the other practices are not. So, in the sense that you know, I might be representing the company. That's often the case. I have the company. But I have 12 executives that need lawyers, and I need to, to bring in uh, lawyers for those individuals that the company is going to pay for. And so, you know, the White Collar is such a referral network that we do try to help each other, do try to support each other. And the whole premise of the Women's White Collar Defense Association is we should, we, we should be referring business to women and we should be referring business to diverse lawyers. So that's what's going to change things. You know, to enable women to develop a strong book of business, and that's what moves the needle. And so, you know, I, I am a big supporter of women. I have lots of male friends. But when I have a piece of business, that business should go to a woman. And so for anybody in the room that is referring business to a man, I would just challenge you to, to think about that. Think about that. <laughs> because they have plenty of men referring them business. <laughs> They're doing just fine. But when you have business to give out, you know, give it to, give it to a woman. Give it to a diverse lawyer. Because that's what moves the needle. Um, and that's what will change things. Judge Trogger, I know you were, uh, you were telling us just before we walked in sort of about a networking group. Have you had an experience that you're meeting after this? Um, have you had this experience in your in your career of having support, a support from a quarter of women? Um, yes. Um, I would say that uh, I started uh, practicing in Nashville in 76. And, and we could all get in the room for a potluck, <laughs> the women <laughs> that were practicing. And uh, so we have remained very, very fast friends. Several of them were law school classmates of mine because I went to law school here. And uh, yeah, I don't know what I would have done without my, my core group of women friends, many of whom became judges, state judges. Um, uh, and uh, they've been very, very important to me. I'm in a book group that we started in the 80s, and most of them are, are women that are part of that, uh, that core group. Uh, because I, I was sitting here trying to think now, when have I been in an environment where 
like you're in, where there were all these women. I've never been in that environment. I've always been sort of the only woman, basically, except for uh, a brief time. I was I was with a one of the firms I was with in Nashville, an entertainment firm, had 16 lawyers, and then they were merged with White Tent Combs, which is a big firm. I hate the big firm life, uh, but there were other women there. But but that was uh, that was not where I felt I had buddies. Uh, I felt I had competitors who, you know, may have felt differently about merging with our firm. I don't know. I didn't feel like I had buddies in there at all. So And so I've never really been in, a, in that environment. How are you the, the male judges? You know, you're the only female judge in the district court, right? Right. So how, how are your colleagues? Are they toward you? <laughs> oh, they're great. I'm, I'm the old woman at this point, you know. I mean, my, all three, I have only three colleagues now. and. Um, uh, one of them has been on the bench three years. One of them's been on the bench a year and a half. And one of them's been on the bench about three months. Mm -hmm. So, and I've been on the bench 20 years. Yeah. So I can teach them all. They call me all the time asking for advice. It's wonderful. I feel like, you know, I'm mentoring them. Uh, uh, but, I mean, it wasn't always that way, of course, yeah. uh, when I was a young pup, I guess. Uh, too young, but anyway. Um, and, and, uh, they treated me different ways, but they, they were always very kind, and uh, I looked to them for advice, and they gave it to me, and and uh, and they were they always treated me well. I, I I I mean I can think of a few sexist kind of things that went on, but um, but for the most part, yeah, that's great. And now we have we have uh, four magistrate judges, and uh, uh, two of them are women. Well, we really have three slots. We have one that's on recall, but uh, two of the three full-time magistrate judges are in. Do you have any questions? Um, this is a great panel and uh, great folks to pose a question to. Any any questions from the? This is the quietest you guys have been all day. <laughs> yes, over here. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the pushback or even backlash so for instance thanks. I, I wondered if you could talk a bit about the pushback or backlash that sometimes happens when women form their own communities and men say well we're all alike we should all be working together <clears throat> or you're excluding us um, has that ever happened to you or colleagues? Do you have a response? Yeah. Well, uh, when we formed the Women's Bar Association uh, in the late 70s, um, our biggest debate, are we going to be the Lawyers Association of Women or the Lawyers Association for Women? That was our biggest debate. And whether or not men could be members. And we very wisely decided that we were the Lawyers Association for women, and we embraced males as our members. And one of our goals was to encourage our members to join the mainline bar associations, in addition to the Lawyers Association for Women. We were very sensitive to it not being a separatist kind of organization, and it was a very smart thing. Yes, I will say for sure. I think, um, so I think a lot of the firms are having these um, women's networking events where you can get your nails done, you do the spa, and I'm a spa girl, so I love those things. I know that not all women love them, but I love them. And the, you know, definitely one of the, the male lawyers, sort of tongue in cheek, was like, what do you mean? I like a massage, why can't I be there? And I said, I don't know and I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> At the end of the day, this was for us, by us, and that was okay. Like, I was totally comfortable saying that this is our space, and for today it's going to be our time in this space, and you should go and do something different. But, go play golf. I, well, that's what I said. I'm like, you know, I can remember the number of times I've been at the firm, even as a sub, from the time with Summer Associates, all these golfing events, they're going out, maybe you got invited if you overheard a conversation that people were going to do things. And I was always, if I overheard, I was going to be there. I never played golf. I don't really like golf. But I recognize that just the discussions and that were happening on those trips were so key and important. So I'd invite myself on those trips. 
but so many times you've been excluded for whatever reasons, and I don't ever think those things are malicious. Um, and usually people are not thinking about it, but I don't, I don't feel any need to apologize for trying to create something that creates that same sort of camaraderie and networking for women or for non-white lawyers. I think that's totally fine, and I just say, you know, well, sorry I feel that way. <laughs> and legally, you're not a protected class. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> I mean, I, I I handle it the same way. I say, okay, you know, when you want to be the recognized minority, okay. You know? <laughs> if you want to trade places, all right. 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 You know? right. Yeah. There was a big push. I remember. I think it was in the early '80s for women to learn to play golf for this very reason. Not just women lawyers, but women in business and uh, all kinds of professions because that's where a lot of the stuff, all of the business, that's a lot of business was taking place absolutely. on the golf course and we were being like totally that. excluded. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Any brave men? Oh, no, Joy. Not a brave man. Uh, <laughs> some of the times when I have made a joke or had somebody make a comment that I thought was over the line, it wasn't way over the line, it was kind of over the line. And I'll give an example that just happened this week. I was exchanging emails with an older male attorney who was on the other side, and we were in settlement negotiations, and he asked if we could have a call on Sunday, and I said, sure, we need to resolve this because we have a hearing coming up, and we need to figure out if we're going to do a deal or not. So we have this call, and he sends me a calendar invitation, and he invites the associate who's working with me on the case, and it says, call with young ladies. Um, and then, <laughs> and, then um, and, and then, and then the next email subject line also had call with young ladies. Uh, and, and then after we settled the case, you know, he made some comment that I think that in his mind it was innocuous, right? It was, um, it was something that was sort of harmless or tongue in cheek or whatever. And I, I think that's the challenge that a lot of women, that internal struggle that we feel is, is this worth saying something about, right? Like, is it, you know, am I making a mountain out of a molehill? Is this indicative of a larger issue? Or, or should I just, you know, let it go, right? Make and a so, joke back. Make a joke back. Call with old man. <laughs> that's yeah, that's, that's, that's acceptable in the comments. That's, that's, yeah, that's what my husband recommended, who is also on my board of directors. So, um, yeah, so, so I'd like to hear, you know, just the thoughts from the room and, and, and from the, the panelists on, um, you, you know, when is it a joke? And then, and then when is it appropriate to point out, hey, you know, you may have meant it as a joke, but this is how I took it, or this is how I received it, or this is what I'm hearing, and and, and how to point that out delicately or diplomatically. That maybe you know a different time or a different place, or maybe never is the time that they can make that comment. I'd say never with that one. If you don't make a joke, make a joke back. Is that the only way to handle that one? If you if you show sensitivity to that, in my view, uh, that's not a wise thing. I don't know. People may feel differently. I mean, that's kind of a jokey thing Yeah. to me. I, I, I didn't take offense right. to it. It was just an example of how I think um, yeah. <clears throat> sometimes you're perceived. I mean, I, I've been practicing for almost 15 years, right? Like, and I still get, how long have you been doing this? And did you just graduate? And did you just pass the bar? And, and sometimes, most of the time, I take Kristen's approach and just let them underestimate me if that's what they're going to do. Um, and, and maybe that wasn't a very good example of, of kind of the commentary that um, I get I, from time I think to time. It's actually a good one because that line is going to be different for everyone and that's okay. Like I may have been completely offended and said, oh my gosh, I can't, I, right? Or someone else might just totally not care. It, it doesn't matter necessarily what the entire room thinks about it. It truly does matter, I think, what you think about it and how you feel about approaching it. If it is something that you want to take a position on or not, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that necessarily. Right? I think we, we may all have different answers about that. I like the idea of, of making it a joke. I probably would have because I'm a little bit sarcastic. Or I might have declined the meeting and sent out a new invite. You know, I, don't, I don't know. Or I might have done nothing. Like, part of it will depend on what else I have to get done. 
Did I need to get, you know, that, to get my kids picked up somewhere and then didn't have time to deal with that in the moment, right? We have real lives. I don't think we all every day are going out there like having to like constantly fight these battles. Sometimes you do and sometimes you want to and sometimes you don't. Like I, I think maybe we spend a lot of time overthinking those things and, make, and honestly exhausting yourself with them. Um, but I think when it matters to you and you take a stand, that's what you should do and that's what matters. You do it in a way that feels good and makes you feel better when it's done. Like my co I had an executive coach in the organization and that was one of the things she told me. She was like, you know, well, how did it make you feel? And I said, it made me feel like this. Well, what would have made you feel good? And I said, well, I had to think about that. Like truly, what would have made me feel good as a response? And I said, maybe this. And I told her like my fears around doing that and how the discomfort around it. And she was like, okay, what would have made you feel, feel the best? And thinking about that as being the right answer. And sometimes what would have made me feel the best would have been to go and run 10 miles and come back and forget about it, right? And that was gonna be what was fine for me at that moment. And for other things, it was gonna be completely calling it out in the moment of time would have made me feel best. But so I, don't, I think it's a hard question to answer because it's so nuanced and it really depends on. And I also yeah. think times are changing yes. on this issue. Um, I, I even see that they're changing for me. So, you know, my dad is, is 84. And for years, I had sort of the dad exception. You know, like if one of my male partners, senior partners, said something to me that was, you know, probably close to the line, but it was sort of that cute dad thing, <laughs> um, I, I would let him get away with it. I just think that in light of the Me Too movement, in light of everything that's going on, in light of the enlightenment that's happening among our male colleagues, I think times times are changing and. You know, the dad exception, the Joe Biden exception might not apply anymore. Um, and, but I also think our male colleagues are getting smarter about this. And, and hopefully that individual will stop sending those, <laughs> those yeah. calendar emails. Comment back here from a great man. Well, sitting back from the uh, law firm standpoint, um, to date I've worked with, I just added up uh, about 326 attorneys I've worked with now with the two law firms I've been with. I've never worked with an African-American female attorney at either firm. And when I add up the years of how long both firms have been in business, we're talking 300 and something years. And neither firm has ever had an African-American partner. So I guess my question is, how do we solve that issue of African-American women being really pushed behind the scenes and not looked upon? It's a great, it's a great question. I was just looking at some stats um, this morning. So women of color now account for 3.19% of partners at major U.S. law firms. And um, that's women of color. So break it down, that's 1.38% Asian, 0.77% Hispanic, and 0.68% African American. I mean, those statistics are startling and shocking. And um, we, all have to, we all have to work on this, again, at an individual level. Um, it's, it's hard, I see it at the law firm, um, it's very hard to recruit. Um, so the, the, the schools at which we recruit, um, the candidate pool is, is small, and then all the firms are buying for the individual. So it's hard kind of bringing people in the door, but that's not the key part. The key part is retaining them, giving them opportunities, promoting them, exactly what you said. You know, you can't just bring diverse candidates in the door. You have to make sure they succeed. Um, so this is, this is a big issue. And in, in DC, um, the Women's Bar Association has, has taken this on. And they have created, what they're doing is a task force um, to try to change this at law firms and within corporations. But it's, there is so much work to be done on this issue. I agree, as we said earlier, about the intentionality of this discussion. I wholeheartedly believe that I was better situated from my 
current position because my predecessor was a woman who took what I told her several years ago about my desires to lead the public defender's office to heart. And when she began to think about that she was not going to be the public defender anymore, she recalled that conversation and then she helped to cultivate me and share her network with me and help me be in position to be ready when the time came for this position to open up. So it's on all of us to make sure that when I am in a discussion where I have the opportunity to promote someone that I can say, you know, I would like to recommend this young woman of color or young man of color or whatever the, the criteria is, when I get the opportunity to have those discussions, it's on me to make sure I'm doing that. And I think it's on all of us. If you get to, uh, you know, you're fortunate to be on the Partner Consideration Committee, then I think it is important for you to understand <coughs> those statistics and you get the opportunity to make the recommendations of people that can change the stats. Everybody who has an opportunity for leadership, you know, be it recommending somebody for an appointment, leveraging your council relationships or your other relationships to get those names in the door for appointments and elevation, that is what will, will begin to change those stats. It requires people to have those conversations that are happening, but they typically don't include the names that need to be on those lists. Sarah? So, um, I'm trying to figure out if I'm the oldest person in the room. Uh, no? Okay. Um, but, um, so, I'm a, a law professor at Merida, and uh, my field was education law when I was teaching, and I've done a lot of work on diversity, particularly on the diversity pipeline, uh, from preschool to the profession. And so I've been talking about this a really long time. That's how I feel, uh, and it's true. And I've sort of heard most of what each of you have said at least once before, if not many times before. And I'm sitting here feeling really depressed um, because I don't hear very much different. So I, I don't remember anymore what year the Palmore Pledge was. Remember this, where all the corporations got together and they pledged and they signed letters. And now we've got this thing where 150 more people are going to sign pledges. And we don't see the change in the numbers you just read and um, the remark about never having worked with a black woman partner. Uh, these are all very depressing things. So I'd like to ask you what you can do that's different how you can change your templates and your mindset. So I, I was also struck by your remark, well, we only recruit from a few firms, and, uh, a few law schools, and we, uh, so how about redefining who's good enough to work at Sidley? Um, how about thinking maybe somebody's good enough who went to some of the law schools that are represented in this room? Uh, I, anyway, so I, I would put the challenge out there. I, I'm not going to see this change in my lifetime, but maybe in my daughter's lifetime. But I only think that's going to happen if we all start doing something more different, harder, longer. And a piece of me thinks that that revolves around implicit bias um, and systemic change around that. But a piece of me also thinks we really have to change our templates. And I, I'd like to hear you talk about why, what you can do so we won't be having this conversation another 30 years from now. Yeah, no, it's it's an excellent point. And you know what we have been trying to do is exactly that. You know, what can we do differently? Um, so we have now been recruiting in Atlanta at the Southeast Minority um, Job, I think it's Job Fair is the proper title. Um, so we have been trying, like what are the other outlets we can go to? We, we don't just have to rely on the top eight law schools, which is typically the case at, at big law. You know, it's going to be a, a really small sliver of the, the law school. So we are trying to, to get out of that box. We're trying to look for judges. You know, judges have great candidates and, and great referrals. They can make excellent referrals. Um, so we are trying to, to do things things differently, but it's hard. It's a hard, it, this is a hard problem to solve. But we're committed to it. I think that changes are happening and representation really does matter. So here in Nashville, you know, 
10 years ago when I started as a public <clears throat> defender, I didn't see very many African American women being elected to a countywide position. And then I started to see African Americans being elected to countywide positions. And I decided, certainly, if these trailblazing women can do it, then I can too. But not only that, they didn't hoard it all for themselves. When I made the decision that I wanted to run for, run for office, I went to those women and rather than saying, oh, you can do it, I'm going to save all of my networks and keep all of this to myself, they literally just rolled it all out for me. They welcomed me in, they called people, they set up meetings for me, they really navigated how I could also be successful. And because of that, I then made sure to take my eight-year-old with me on the campaign trail because I want her to see that this is something that you can accomplish. So I think there we have a long way to go. I'm 100% with you. And we have to look at our recruiting practices, even in government. <coughs> it is very, government is, is a place that we need to look at that as well. But what I have found, at least since September, since I have been elected, I have received substantially more applicants from women of color, certainly, who see that, oh, the leader of this office is a black woman. I'm going to send my resume in, and at least we can have the conversation. So I think the representation is important. And then I just open the book. Don't hoard it all for yourself once, you, once you're in that position. And I also would say, I, I think there's just a difference in thinking. Like, I don't think the gold standard of being a lawyer is working at a big law firm. I've done that. I could have been a partner. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something that was different. And so I think we also just need to reimagine or rethink what is having your best career. For, for me, it personally is not that. That's not what I wanted. And so I think a lot of folks are just going on a different path and finding their successes there. We're seeing more female GCs, still not the levels that we need to see, but we're seeing more, more females being judges, more and so I think things are changing, but I think also people are just making decisions that the, the law firm path is not the only path to success. Um, you know, and I, it's hard if you want to have a family. Right, exactly. Like you're just making different, I did go to an Ivy League school, right? I could have done, that's, but that's not what I wanted to do. I made different decisions, and when I look at my classmates, some of them are still firm, some of them have gone on to different things, but they all have very successful careers. If you'd asked them whether or not they hadn't made it to the pinnacle, they would have looked at you and said, uh, no, I'm doing just fine. I'll see you in Dubai next week. Right? They're, they're all doing the things that they want to do. So I think we're redefining also what is success with respect to being in the legal profession. There's so many different spaces to be in it. And so I, I think that's a piece of it. And you're still, again, competing for all those folks. But I definitely would challenge you, especially being in DC, to go to the HBCUs and other places that are producing such great diverse candidates. Um, you have to go where the people are. There, you know. But that being said, um, I just think that there, there are a lot more choices out there and people are not seeing the law firm necessarily as being the end all be all to having a, a legal career. And I think to your point about mm -hmm. going to HBCUs, you have to change the culture of the place where you are, are going to the HBCU from. So mm -hmm. those students are going to to look into the background of that firm and that messaging is going to be clear before you ever even arrive on campus. And the culture is present. You know, I knew that I wanted to be in the public interest side of things, but I often researched before I did my interviews and what that message was clear to me before I started, whether it was going to be an inclusive place, whether there was a path for growth for me, whether there were people there who were going to mentor and cultivate me, or was I going to be the diverse candidate? Was I going to make the annual report as the diverse candidate and from the South or on every from the, you know <laughs> what that that message is being put out there before you ever even arrive for the recruiting trip. So I think that culture change within is necessary as well. And you might have to um, bring some other people to the table to have those culture change discussions. So you've done this research and education. It might require bringing in someone like that to have the conversation amongst the partners in the big firm, or bringing someone in who's not necessarily a part of the inter the inner leadership to have have a meaningful discussion about this. That's great. And I think the key is, you know, whatever whatever. Um, 
area in which the lawyer wants to succeed, whether it be big law or inside a corporation or inside the judiciary or inside the public defender's office, whatever area, you know, there should just be the opportunity to succeed. And that's why it's incumbent on us to make those opportunities. So it's really regardless of the sector in which the individual practices, it's really all the same. We focus on those numbers because they're available, right? And we spend a lot of time talking about them. And I would say that we don't just need to talk about that space. I think you're right. We need to talk about it a little bit more globally and see whether we are moving the needle. I think in some spaces we are. But to your point, there's tremendous, <coughs> tremendous work to be done. Tremendous. Okay, I'm a little cheered up. <laughs> so April, uh, I don't know about our time. We had a question waiting down here on the end. She already has a mic. No? I, I just wanted to point out that you showed the article about the 170 GCs, but um, there was another article written by an African-American male, I did see followed that. by an article called Talent or Token, Lawyers Say Diversity Still Can Be Just for Show, with Justice Leah Shears and um, some prominent attorneys in Atlanta who are basically saying, you know, law firms or as I believe you told a story about, you know, making a pitch with African American attorneys, but then not putting them on the work. And so this is a heated conversation going on in Atlanta right now, which, you know, we have a really great, diverse legal community, um, very much like DC, which, you know, if you need some candidates, I can send some your way. Because, <laughs> um, you know, that's not an issue. They're qualified candidates in DC. Um, but it, it's, it's a hot topic, and it does need to be addressed. I'm glad it was addressed in this room, but I started my career at a law firm being the only African-American associate. I am now <coughs> a boutique firm where I'm the only African-American associate, and I'm considering another firm where there are no female African-American shareholders. And it's like, well, I started in 94. This is 2019. It can get a little. I just wanted to make one point. Uh, the law schools are required to give reports on how their uh, graduates are doing, whether they're finding jobs or not. And there are a lot of schools, particularly when you're talking about minority graduates, they're not able to find jobs. I mentor a lot of young <coughs> students and new lawyers and they're working at Starbucks. And some of it is Michigan economy, I understand all of that, but a lot of firms are just not hiring them. The other point I wanted to make is, long, long time ago when I was an assistant prosecutor, the prosecutor <coughs> got the idea to only hire those from Ivy League schools. And they were falling flat on their faces in a courtroom. There are people that have degrees from state universities that make some of the finest criminal lawyers around. They become very, very successful. And then lastly, I spoke at the Bank of America for one of their uh, conferences. And I was talking about this. If you're hiring a firm, and maybe there's a trial, and the trial is in front of a minority judge, or the jury is composed of minorities, you can't just come into that courtroom without anyone sitting at the table and you can't grab someone who happens to work in your firm in the environmental section and bring them in on a tort case and they're just sitting there. The jury will notice that there's no conversation going on at the breaks, that they're not intricately involved in examining any of the witnesses. So the whole thing of diversity is really very important, but you've got to be able to see that big picture. And so I, I'm totally enjoying this panel. You guys have made some great, great points that need to be followed up on. Thank you. We have time to get time. All right. Thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate that.